welcome to Urbanite. Um, about Urbanite, I just want to make you aware we are an active movie and TV prop house, so um, please feel free to enjoy this space at will, but um, don't touch the prop stacks because some of those things are prepped to go out, so they're, they're, they're all organized you know, in ways to go out. But um, if you love the space here, it is available to rent for any events or music or photo shoots, and we host a lot of community events up here every month, including small batch concerts, comedy, and the local monthly variety show called The Saturday Thing. Um, if you haven't been to Urbanite before, which is based mostly downstairs, um, we are Portland's original lifestyle store. We are a fifth generation Portlander, Latino woman owned, small business, supporting 54 small maker, designer, and creative businesses under one roof. While additionally elevating and supporting over 200 small businesses throughout the year with markets, productions, fine art shows, events, concerts, photo and video productions, volunteering, and community fundraising. We are a center for the Southeast community and we are fun, so definitely come check us out when you're done here. Down, come downstairs and check it all out. Um, we have decided to host this forum and you have decided to attend because although our politics may differ from Phoenix Wheel, we all agree that the lack of community safety for both our businesses and our citizens have come to an untenable state and it needs to be brought to the forefront of priorities for our city. Thank you for adding your voice to that concern and with that, I'll turn the floor over to PDX Real. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I'll make sure I eat this mic, okay, so you can hear me? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. My name is Julie McConnell. Mark and I are 40-year residents of Northeast Portland. Normally, I'm the good, you know, the girl Friday. I just bring scissors and tape, and somehow I ended up here at the mic, so I hope you can put up with me for a little bit. Um, first, We'd really like to thank Urbanite. Thank you, Troy and Rachel, and all of you that have helped put this together. They have paid attention to every single little detail um, in getting this going for us. We came, it was set up, it was great, and it's such a blessing to be able to use this space. To get us started, we have a couple specifics. We're gonna have a few speakers. We have stories to share with you, and then there will be an open mic, as Angela mentioned. We want to hear from you. How have you been impacted? What do you want from your city and your county? Please sign up at that table there over to my right, um, and we'll hopefully we'll be able to fit you in for a little bit, three, you know, for three minutes. Um, for myself, you know, I've lived for a long time, and Portland has changed a lot. And I know that you're all familiar with this story of a city that was clean and beautiful and livable and safe. And it's not that city anymore. And I've been trying to figure out why, trying to understand it. At the very least, it looks uncaring. And at the worst, it appears to be deliberate. But I think what is most likely occurring is a commitment to ideologies and a polarization in our politics that tempts us to ignore what's obvious and what's right in front of us. Our city blindly forges ahead with whatever seems good, what the loudest voices demand, what might work, what we'd like to work, what a study says, what is fashionable, progressive, appealing, what strikes us as compassionate. You know, we had some officials from our state go to another state and look at how they handled the homeless pro um, problem and they came back and said that it didn't fit Portland's ethos. Well, I don't really like this ethos, no. if that's what ethos is. And if progressive means what it should mean, that we're making progress towards something better, well, we're failing. We're failing miserably, this is not progress. This is worse for everyone, and this has to change. PDX Real documents what is happening in Portland in regards to crime, policy, policies, homelessness, and livability. It challenges its followers to get involved in their own governing, fight off apathy and hopelessness, and to get involved in saving our community. Jeff Church, I don't know where he's at, he should be at the back. Jeff Church manages the Twitter for PDX Real. And I'd like to introduce you to someone very dear to me. She is passionate and compassionate. She's committed to our community. She cares deeply for the people of this city. 
and is committed to making Portland a place where people want to live and can live. Angela Todd is the founder and administrator of PDX Real on Instagram and Facebook, and she's going to come up and speak to us now. I'm hoping today Erica is here. Erica works on PR, and she said to me the other day, what do you want the headline to say after the press conference, Angela? And I was dumbfounded, because I didn't know what, I, what does that headline say? How do I wordsmith this? And I said, let me settle on what I want today. What I, what I want is for people to, number one, know that they're not alone. Number two, I want them to know that this is a self-rescue. And that unless you help us rescue you and yourself and the rest of the community, nothing's going to change. Amen. In my role with PDX Real, I receive stories from people every day. And I wanted to share a few with you. These are not uncommon stories. I could just substitute the person in a different neighborhood for the same victim story. But I wanted to share a few with you about what's happening in our city. Areas of our neighborhoods and our parks and our business districts are completely off limits. We have women that tell me frequently that they will not go out at night we have grandparents and families that won't let their children play in their yard anymore. Public transit is so unsafe that the only people who take public transit are people that are mentally unwell, dealing drugs, or the least fortunate of all of us that have to take public transformation, public transportation to get around. That's a $3.5 billion project that we spent money on that is completely unsafe. This woman was assaulted in Woodstock. She's 65 years old. She doesn't drive and she's retired. She was walking a few blocks from her home and someone hit her with a bottle in her face knocked her unconscious, and gave her a concussion. She doesn't remember how she got home, but neighbors tell the story that a man was trying to help her, and she was screaming at him because she thought he was her attacker. She went to her home, what she thought was her home, and she fell in the yard, and the postwoman realized that it was her house that was across the street and helped her get home. She didn't call the police. Why is that? Our streets are full of organized crime, open drug deals, and mentally unwell people living among us with zero solutions from our city, our county, and our legislature. Businesses on Division, Powell, Woodstock, Downtown, The Pearl, Montevilla, I've talked with many of them. They are broken into regularly. Some of them reporting five different break-ins and robberies. It's unbelievable. Canceled insurance policies. There's a woman here today that owns a consignment shop there is a man outside mentally unwell and his raging is so out of control she closed her business for five days because she felt unsafe. I'm going to read to you what she said. Maybe I'm not. I'm just going to do it for memory. I have a lot of copies of things up here. He stole 
He went into her business. He stole a pair of pants and shoes and some other items to a rosary, a vintage rosary. He was outside raging. He began to masturbate. Then he began to break merchandise, kick in things, lick the concrete. She called, nobody came. She just closed her business for a week. I had another business. Some of you have seen this. 2.5 million people have seen it at this point. Northeast Portland business owner. She, uh, it was her dream to open up a boutique. She did. There's camping out front. There's a woman that many of you recognize from all over town who's, who's, who, who needs detox badly. She, um, she called me because she said, I called the police and they came and they gave him a bottle of water and left and she chucked it into the street. She's everywhere, she's screaming at my clients, my, my customers aren't coming in, what do I do? And I said, well, you can try by asking her to leave. What a crazy thing to do, huh? Tell people no. I could go on and on about these stories ATMs, banks, under regular attack. I talked with the, a credit union that is in the Safeway on, in Woodstock. They've had four burglaries. It's in the Safeway. <laughs> Do you guys understand how crazy this is? I don't know. It's crazy. Don't be apathetic with me. Don't do it. This is absolutely insane. True. Emergency services are taxed because this mentally unwell and this drug epidemic of this fentanyl and this meth is something that has never swept us before. It is making people psychotic, it is making them violent, it is making them cause fires. There is record overdoses. They need help. There is absolutely inadequate detox. We have funded, we have decriminalized individual uses of drugs and yet our, our our governor and the governing that they do for measure 110 has not rolled out the mental health and the drug rehabilitation that they promised us and instead they have left these people on our streets taken our money and expected us to live with this The, the, the news did not report this because it's, 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 too, it's too upsetting, I think, or maybe they just don't know. But Sarah Pliner was on 26, Highway 26, and was hit by, she, she was riding her bicycle and a semi hit her. Everyone says we need barricades at that unsafe intersection. But did you know there was no ambulance to send and she was alive at the scene? I want you to take that in for a second. I listen to the scanner on a regular basis and I have people who, PDX Real isn't just me by the way, people send me information, there's no way I can be all those places, but it is very common that there is no ambulance to send. It's regular, you guys, it's regular, there's no fire to send, there's no police to send. Most of you know that the police officers don't come for a few hours. The reason our emergency services are so taxed is because there's no place to send these people. I don't know about you, but when I have a heart attack or somebody I love, I certainly want to know that they can get help. I've been asking myself for a while, seven years to be precise, what the hell is happening? And I've settled on a few things talking to a lot of people, because I'm a problem solver. And the only reason I'm here is because I've decided it can't get better unless we all do something. We love you. Right now, the outcome of arrest doesn't mean prosecution. People are released immediately. Right now, if somebody who's arrested with multiple warrants, there was one yesterday alone, I look at multiple arrests all the time, rap sheets of people not showing up for court, not showing up with open warrants. This man had stolen a car five times, assaulted people. They arrested him. He said, I just, I just ingested a whole bunch of fentanyl. So they took him to the hospital instead of the jail. He's already out. 
It's not isolated. I started looking up people that are in the paper that the news is reporting or the police are putting out by name, and it's unusual that I don't see a rolling rap sheet. We've been catching and releasing people around here for a long time. I'm okay with a little bit of social justice, I really am, but there's no consequences, and people know it. We have insufficient detox, I've talked about that. Catch and release, talked about that. State Police Academy, takes months to get in. Our state has made it that way. DA is more concerned with social justice and equity than justice for the people. They have three sections of the jail closed. The county has billions of dollars. And they tell the police regularly whenever they, you notice sometimes they want to arrest people, it's because the jail won't take them because they're full. Had somebody tell me recently, well, it's because it's not staffed, Angela. That's funding. Yeah. Housing first. That's what we're pushing. Wait five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, 25. We don't have any time for this. Not only that, the reason they're outside is because they lost their home. Yep. Yep. They need help. Yep. No place to take people. Focused on output instead of results. Unwilling to show up and talk to the people. Jessica Vega Peterson, are you here? Mayor Wheeler, anybody from the office? Big surprise. <laughs> I looked. Surprise. They were all invited. Our job is to hold our government accountable. Yes. If you don't realize that this is, they have to have somebody who holds them accountable. We are set up as a republic and to do just that. We are their only boss. Some of us are doing a lot of work right now. And, uh, and some of us are scared. And if you're scared, I wanna ask you, thank you, Julie, for this yet last night. What aren't you scared that you can do? Because many hands make light work, and we have got to push against this ethos. How many of you here have considered moving from Portland or Oregon in the last two years? Please raise your hand. Two hands. <laughs> no more. Stand How many people here have been financially impacted based on what's going on in the street with public safety and crime in the last two years? Apathy has brought us here. Most of us have spent our entire life away from the public sector and what it is they're doing. We thought that we should vote and then they'll take care of it. They're not taking care of it, folks. No, they're not. No. And I can't wait two years to vote again. Nope. And neither can you. Nope. No way. Right. No, no way. way. I am asking the county, the legislature, and the city to start working together and come to the community and tell us what they are immediately doing in these neighborhoods and business districts. Absolutely, yes. yes. I'm tired of the posturing. I have received private messages from people in the city and the county that work there and work for these people who have told me that they are fighting over who's gonna be the person who gives the solution. The only reason Mayor Wheeler's tried to do the sanction camping is because the county is not doing their job. Yep. Absolutely. That's right. County's complicit. Self-rescue yourself. Be more than you thought you could be in this fight. Do not stand down. No is a full sentence. Would you like to hear a hopeful story? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. 
My church is located off of Northeast Fremont. Milton is the street in back of us. We have a Popeyes across the street on 82nd and a tattoo place across the street. For a while, we had a marijuana shop. There's a methadone clinic on one corner and a very um, bad motel at the back on Milton. I like to call it a full service corner because the church is there too, right? <laughs> And so it's been a difficult neighborhood for a long time. But over the past few years, it's gotten a lot worse, and certainly um, during the pandemic, much, much worse. For a while, I would go to the back fence because people were starting to put their clothing, their tarps, tents on the fence at the church, and I'd say, hey, you know, you can't do that. Please take your stuff down. One day, when we had an RV there, and toxic waste, you know, spilling out of it and just trash everywhere. You couldn't walk on the sidewalk. It was un felt unsafe to drive down the street. I asked a man to take his tent off the, or his tarp off of the fence, and he looked at me, and you've heard that, that saying, if looks could kill? And I realized I'm done talking to the people on that side of the fence. We're done now. And then in the next four months, we had six murders on Milton Street. So that was bad, right? And then eventually the city did come out and clean it up, but we knew that it was just gonna come back. And so some of us at the church were talking about it. What are we gonna do? It's just gonna come back. We have to do something about this. So the first thing that came to my mind is, you know, we've, we've really, not been engaging with our neighbors. We need to get to know our neighbors. We need to talk to them. Angela, my daughter Evelyn, and I went out into the neighborhood and started knocking on doors. And I didn't know what to expect. Are people going to slam the door in my face? Are they going to be willing to talk to me? And I want to tell you, there wasn't one person who wasn't willing to talk to me. Everyone, without exception, was open and friendly and concerned about their neighborhood. And the other thing I learned is that this neighborhood that had appeared so distressed to me, because I'm looking at the full service corner there, right, with all this garbage, needles, people defecating, urinating, doing drugs, setting up tents, by the way, not homeless encampments. These are shooting galleries where people shoot up, fall asleep, and then get up and take off not a homeless encampment, but organized crime. So I meet all of these neighbors and I discover that right next to this is a really incredibly wonderful neighborhood with people who are engaged with one another, who care about one another, who mow the lawn for their neighbor when they see that she's working too many hours and can't get to it who raise money to cover up the graffiti and paint a mural in the middle of the street. It was heartwarming. It was wonderful. And I met some really remarkable people. And I want to introduce one of those remarkable people to you, Alan Lubke. I'm Alan Lukey. Julie, thanks for the introduction. Julie has been a real hero in our neighborhood, and um, she cannot be commended enough for what she and her husband Mark and some other people, members of her church, have done for our neighborhood. So I'm a lifelong Oregonian. I grew up in Hillsboro, attended Hillsboro High School, graduated from the University of Oregon with a degree in journalism, and I've lived in a lot of places in Oregon in the last 15 years. <coughs> Two years ago, I rented this house on this corner of Northeast 85th and Milton. And it's this really cute house. And I just had been looking for a long time and I loved it and I, I picked it up right away. Well, I moved in in March and that summer, things started to get pretty, uh, pretty bad in the neighborhood around this motel that's on the, uh, the, other, the other end of the block. It's called Madison Suites. And in about five months, there was four or five or six homicides. There were shootings so regularly that neighbors made up this game called fireworks or gunshots. You know, we were never quite sure what we were hearing. 
but it was really, really common. Um, as Julie said, there was this m massive encampment that made the street almost impassable, where people actually stopped driving on the street. Um, there was tons of open air fentanyl use, heroin use, meth use, extreme, the type of things that are very, very dangerous for every human around it. There were all sorts of abandoned cars on the street that people were using for prostitution and drug use, and just extremely volatile, very dangerous. Nobody felt safe. So, as I started to get to know the community more and get to know my neighbors, I started to realize that it's this really exceptional group of people. People who have created their own community garden, people who have created their own uh, farmer's market, who have started their own businesses in the neighborhood, people who paint the intersections with murals every summer, a neighborhood that has veterans of foreign war, mixed race, members of the trans community, and everyone was wonderful. And I started to ask, why does this neighborhood have this problem in it when everyone seems like they're just these really great members of Portland trying to live good lives? And so I was like, well, what can I do? I, I've never done anything in the community. I'm not even a consistent voter. I don't even, I'm, not, I'm not a homeowner. And I thought, well, I'm the new kid on the block. I'm not burned out on this issue. Maybe I can just make a Zoom meeting and maybe bring people together. And so I did that. I, started, like, I made a Zoom meeting, invited a bunch of people, maybe like a dozen people showed up. And I just asked one question. I said, what's the problem? And everybody said, the motel. And I was like, oh, like there's not like a, a secondary or third problem? They're like, no, it's the motel. We don't have these problems in our neighborhood. And that, that turned out to be true. There is no other part in this neighborhood that has these problems. And so what we did was, it, identifying the problem as the motel, it gave us something to direct our attention towards. And we didn't know what to do. No one in this group had any experience with solving these types of problems. It, it, certainly me as well. And so um, we got in touch with CNN, which is the Central Northeast Neighborhood Association. And they helped us learn more about chronic nuisance properties and getting in touch with our neighborhood response team officer, which is part of the Portland Police Department. This started getting us a little bit more education about how we can work with other organizations in the city, but nothing, nothing changed yet. Well, then the Oregonian got involved. And the Oregonian took a real strong interest in our story. You have four people, five people get murdered in you know, uh, several months, two in the same weekend. Journalists tend to take interest. They wrote a real comprehensive investigative story about what was going on. That ended up in the mayor's office. The mayor's office ended up contacting our group. We continued to meet every two weeks. They started taking action. They made the street no parking. Suddenly, all these abandoned cars got towed. Uh, BDS got involved, did an inspection of the property, found three dozen code violations. Um, the encampment was swept, um, which was very important because like Julie said, it was not people who were living there. It was people who were coming to do fentanyl, which is anyone who knows a bit about fentanyl knows that it's real scary stuff. Um, and things started to get better. Uh, and now things are a lot better. It's kind of, that motel is kind of a quiet space now. S neighborhood's pretty safe. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better, and we have a real close relationship with the neighbors and the city, um, and things are looking very positive. So that's the story, but the thing that I really want to share with you today is the five things that a group of people who had no idea what to do and no skills did to actually make a difference, and I think you can all do this as well. The first thing is make the problem your business. Even if you didn't cause the problem, if even if you feel you have no responsibility for it, make it your problem. Be the one who decides, I'm going to make this a moral issue. I cannot not confront this problem. Great, good soundtrack. Um, two, you're going to need a leader in the beginning. This work is not fun. It's not sexy. It's not glamorous. It's slow. Sometimes it's even like physically dirty. And no one wants to do that type of work, including me. And someone needs to pull the weight in the beginning. And that's how you're going to get momentum going. And so find someone, preferably yourself, who is willing to show up, do the work, schedule the meetings, take the notes, send the summaries, email the city, show up, show up, show up, pick up the garbage. Three, know your goal. If your goal is to improve your neighborhood, reduce violence, it's a, it's a great vision. It's not very actionable, though. 
our goal was let's deal with this motel. It gave us something to direct our energy towards. And then once you solve that goal, you can then do the same thing on the next goal. Four, connect over your commonalities. Don't divide over your differences. This group of neighbors is now probably a couple dozen people that regularly attend. I don't know how anyone has voted in this group. I don't know other than Julie, probably their religion. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know what their stance is on abortion, gun control, anything like that. And it doesn't matter because the, our goal is community safety. And if we wanted to divide ourselves among all the things that we could find to dislike each other over, we could. Those things exist but we choose not to make them part of our strategy. We focus on what brings us together, and that's that we live next to each other and we're all facing the same problem. Five, and this is probably the most important one, it's the easiest thing that you can do, is do the next thing. Your goal is big, your vision is grand. It's, we got big problems we're trying to solve. You're gonna feel overwhelmed, you're gonna feel discouraged. Sometimes progress is gonna be slow. Sometimes progress is gonna go backwards for a while. Just do the next easiest, most obvious, most comfortable thing. And when you look back three months, six months, a year, you'll have made transformational change just by doing the next thing. And sometimes that's a small, it's just write the next thing on your whiteboard so you even remember to do it. So the thing I wanna leave you with is that me and the neighbors uh, in, my, in this group, we started off afraid. When we worked with the Oregonian, I told the writer, I guarantee you nobody will go on record in your story. We all go on record now and are very public facing. And we went from being afraid to being empowered. And that transformation, not only have we seen something happen in our neighborhood, we've seen it happen in ourselves. And when I moved into this house, I did not plan on two years later speaking at an event like this. But I'm really glad that I am. I'm glad that I'll, I've had the opportunity to become involved in my community. I feel much more empowered. Honestly, I feel a much better member of society too because I was doing nothing before and now I'm doing something. And, and I know that everybody can do that. So thank you for having me. Todd in just a second. Uh, Todd lives in the Lentz area and Todd's going to do a series of just a few um, questions. Are you still up for that? Okay. <laughs> I want to say something about what was just said. When you're upset about something and you're just in the soup of being upset, it's horrible. When you actually start being upset is about change. It's about having energy in you that you want to impact something. Your community needs you. We've, uh, we've been sort of absentee. We've been absentee citizens. So I promise you that if you start to impact, and I can't tell you exactly what you need to do, you have to pick that for yourself. But start where you're pissed. Something's bothering you and making you angry. That means you need to do something about it. Okay, Todd, come on up. We're gonna open up uh, the public piece right after this. So this lectern isn't perfect for who you're calling up, but you'll work it out. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Todd Littlefield, uh, born and raised in Portland, have lived closer here. To the mic. Go closer to the mic. Have lived here 47 of my 52 years, and I am absolutely disgusted, embarrassed, and ashamed of our city. Um, I have reached out to as many local officials as I can, and the response is um, silence, crickets. Uh, there's some signs up here that I think are pretty important. When we call, nobody comes. Um, it's been revealed recently that the county has supplied over 100,000 tarps and tents. These people will never get shelter as long as we continue to enable. Um, the city, I think, is doing better, but the county, Metro, 
and the state need to get on board. They need to get on board immediately. This is an urgent call for action. My neighborhood has been terrorized. I have had shotguns pointed at my head. I've got a bullet in my shop. We've had bombs. Um, Sam Adams was recently uh, let go for harassment, intimidation, and bullying. This happens on a daily basis in my neighborhood. Um, I really wish that Dr. Marion would have been the Multnomah County Chair. That's a very important position. It's almost like a, uh, a, a, a one-person show. That chairwoman controls everything. And they have all the money. Metro has money, the state has money, the county has money. Where is that money going? We need immediate accountability. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that's right, where it's going. <clears throat> We're talking about not millions of dollars, not tens of millions of We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. The light rail, as it was said, was $3.5 billion. You go along Flavelle, Holgate, these stops that are supposed to be picking up people to bring them to work, bring them to the hospital, bring them to where they need to go, you can't access them. They're not safe. I'm really tired of the homeless advocates advocating for drug addicts, drug dealers, criminals, etc. If you want to advocate for that, Come to my home, come to the other 800 encampments because those neighborhoods are being terrorized like mine is. And come grab these people and put them in front of your front door. Yeah. Right, okay? Yeah. But they're moving to camp right down the street in Lentz. What are you going to do about that? Right down the street from my house. Oh, for Way. all those places. Way. Yes, Way. Yeah. Way. What are you going to do about that part of all them coming to our camp, down to our area, our residential, that we don't want them there. They've been going through our neighborhood. Put a, put a mic on her. She okay. needs to be heard. Each one of us need to be heard. The city is not listening, the county is not listening, the metro is not listening, the state is not listening. This is ridiculous. It's got to stop. It's got to stop now. Um, so I think the bottom line is, is that besides all of us need to do something and get active and, 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 and come together because we are the majority. We are the majority. And um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank uh, the news stations. You guys have a serious responsibility. Um, this is about public safety. This is about clean, safe, and livable neighborhoods. I think we all could agree that we'd like to see the homeless in a clean, safe, and stable environment. The idea that we're going to put any shelters in a neighborhood or in a business district to me is absolutely insane. Why can't we put them out by the National Guard, put them on a farm, let them do something productive? The drugs that they are taking now. They're either going to die or they're going to have permanent mental health and brain damage. This is not compassion. This is not compassion. No part of this is compassion. All I hear is about compassion. I'm tired of hearing about compassion. The people in this group here in this room are compassionate. Okay, these are the compassion people that care. Um... <clears throat> I'm not sure. I, I, I could keep going on. I'm sure there's other people that want to speak. I'm using that as an excuse yeah, to get off of here. Yeah. But uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, again, where is the money? And if you're advocating for the homeless, come to my house or any of the other 800 encampments and relieve us of the terror that we are getting on a daily and nightly basis. Thank you. is our timer we're just going to try to keep these things at three minutes she's going to set the timer that'll go off when it's 30 seconds before you have 30 seconds she's just going to put her hand up like that if you don't pay attention to that you'll hear the alarm uh drew Leda, drew will you come up and then i'm just going to call people through come on up for your tell us what you think
City of Roses is wilting, and no one seems to know why. We're ending up in this situation where nobody can seem to explain how we got from where we were, which was a city so gorgeous that I decided to leave the Texas Gulf Coast, a block and a half from the Gulf of Mexico, to move out here. What happened? Let me save you some time. It's not going to take a whole lot of study. It's going to not take a whole lot of foresight. You look at the policies that we had in place when this wasn't an issue, and that's what we start doing again. What happened at the beginning of this press conference when Angela had to return the call of the uh, um, mayor's office? And you ended up with what sounded like the most tone-deaf explanation for their lack of admitting what's wrong here. I got mine this morning. Absolutely. It's an email from the Oregon Audits Division. Let me read it to you. They're talking about how, uh, look, audit press release, Oregon Health Authority. It's too early to tell the challenging implementation of Measure 110. It has increased risks, but the effectiveness of the program has yet to be determined. <laughs> oh, shit. I can tell you it's been very effective. How long? How long it's been effective at raising crime. Yep, it's been effective at closing our businesses. Yep. It's been responsible for my kids leaving the Pacific Northwest clear over the East Coast because that's how strong the escape response <laughs> is to what was going on around here. Three hardest words in the English language. I was wrong. I think that's what we're going to have to hear from a lot of our elected, uh, elected representatives. And this beseechment goes mainly to the House that passes these resolutions and is hearing future resolutions like HB 2880, also known as the Let's Give Crack Pipes Little Kids Bill. Yeah. Oh my God. This is cruelty in the name of compassion. Absolutely. This is an intolerable situation created out of the name of tolerance. This experiment has failed. The social engineering prototype that we were asked to swallow as a recipe for a brighter and future tomorrow is now proving itself to be dangerous to those subjects who are under it. Not only the citizens living in their houses that lived here for a while, but look at what's happening to the cruelty to those people that we're claiming to protect and try and uplift. Right. You have critical reasoning skills or you wouldn't have made it to office. I suggest that you use them, admit you were wrong, and move forward from there. Thank you. Christy is a business owner in Woodstock. Christy? Hi, excuse my mask, but I'm kind of fearful for my safety when people see this, to be honest. I don't even want to tell you what the name of my business is because I don't want any more windows broken in and I don't want to be broken into. I witnessed my business and all the businesses on my street, which is the Woodstock Street. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that. Um, just massive violence, a bunch of vandalism, Ace Hardware won't even fix the windows anymore because it's too expensive and they're just going to get broken again. I have a very small business <laughs> and I was even broken into. My whole back door was broken into. My daughter who works with me told me about it. She called 911. Luckily, when the police did arrive, they said, you're lucky you called in the morning because we did show up. They also told me that there's Careful. nothing they could do about the robbery. They told me to buy cameras, to put them everywhere. And, you know, I'm basically on my own. I put the camera up with the alarm. The alarm sounded off a little bit too often for the homeless people that were living in back of the area. So they came and busted it down. Now, these are things that, you know, I have to pay for myself. I had to pay an electrician, you know, to put it in. I'm really close to the Safeway, and behind the Safeway in the Bymart area, there was a lots of homeless Campsite. encampments. And the, anyway, 
It's just been like this for years. I witness in the Safeway parking lot a fentanyl overdose or come, he was coming down or something. He was shaking like this and he was moving around and there's an ambulance there and a fire truck there. They left him there because he refused to go with them. I was like, what happened to drunken and disorderly? Fentanyl and disorderly is okay to just leave them in the Safeway parking lot where children and elderly people are there? And, you know, I mean, okay. I just don't understand. This guy needed help. He shouldn't be able to say, okay, I don't want to go. They should have taken him and gotten him help. You know, I just lived here most of my life. I've never seen things so bad. I've owned this business for 22 years. I want to stay in business. I want our community back. I want the whole city back. Thank you. Thank you. Michael? I'll start my little three-minute timer here. Good morning or afternoon or whatever the heck it is. My name is Michael Albino. I own Legacy Modern 2105 Southeast 7th Avenue. I feel bad. I, my heart goes out to you. Private ownership as a small business person is everything. Our word is all we have. Our reputation is all we have. We don't always get along. We don't, you know, we do our best. It's okay to be wrong. It's totally okay to be wrong. You know, like the other gentleman was talking about, it's hard. Nobody wants to say they're wrong. And from my experience, uh, just from my point of view, an attitude of profits over people no longer work. All right. It's a choice. We have to make a choice. Are we going to put the health, welfare of our citizens, our fellow humans, above what tax breaks we give away to this big corporation? Or are we just going to allow uh, every idea to just be poo-pooed? We have to try, we have to take action. There's no time for committees, there's no more time for studies, there's no more time for shooting the breeze. We can come back to that later. We have people dying. Absolutely. Dropping dead, stepping in front of trains because their life is, they feel worthless. There's no hope. When you have no hope, there's no way out. If you've ever been in a position of no hope, you know it's dark, it's small, it's cramped, it's closed. You don't know which way to go. And I'm sorry. You know, my, my wife, uh, she was like, look, don't get, don't get angry. You know? <laughs> don't offer solutions because you're going to look like a monster. We need it. Go ahead. Put it out. Put look, it out there. We've been getting uh, a kicker from our state for many years now, extra money that they're not spending. They're giving it back to us. I don't want it. Put it towards something. Please fund schools, teachers, uh, 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 emergency services, housing. Heck, take, take the money, go rent every open hotel room, every motel, something. Give people a safe place to be locked up and then send people out to go talk to them. My one and only vice that I, I have, I love to smoke cigars, and I was one day smoking a cigar at a local shop, and I was talking to a young man who works uh, for Central City Concern, and his whole job is to go around and talk to all these folks and say, hey, look at all these things that are available. 90% of the people tell him, sorry, I'm good. I just want to stay inebriated and checked out. I made a major reinvestment in my business here in, in, in this community because I believe in this community this last year. I more than doubled the size and I, I, I quadrupled the amount of people that I, uh, that I employ. That's five families that I am directly responsible for. And I know I'm out of time. But we have to make a philosophical change. I would love to see our liberal progressive art that we have going that we could lead with. <laughs> but at some point in time, we're going to have to make some hard choices and somebody's going to lose out. That's life. I don't always win. I want people to enjoy themselves. I, I born and raised in, in, in Oakland, California. I witnessed the crack apocalypse. It's not unlike what we've got going on right here, and I'll be done and I'll wrap up. I know other people are here. But we have to change the way that we think. We have to change our actions. We have to make definitive choices. And if we're wrong, we just say we're wrong, and we make the appropriate changes. I'm not worried about getting reelected. I'm not worried about getting refunded. Nope. I'm not worried about any of that stuff. Amen. 
I have to take care of the, the families that are around me, my neighbors. I, 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 in my neighborhood where my store is, there's homeowners along with businesses and major corporations. We're all living together, all trying to make the most of it. But it's really hard when you've got chop shops and people cooking methamphetamines right across the street from this building for a really long time was a meth cooking lab. Cops wouldn't buy it every day. They know it's there. It's not like the city doesn't know, the county doesn't know, the state doesn't know. They all know. But they're too afraid because they don't want to be hung out to dry and, and say, call the bad guy. Huh. Right? I don't, want to, I don't want to have to look and, 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 yeah. and be, be that guy. But be that guy. We're going to have to make some hard choices. Yeah. Make hard choices. Uh, Edward and then Jason I'm gonna kind of Jason put you on deck um, if anybody wants to know what I think they're spending they better need more money they need more accountability by the way and this comes from somebody who's been looking into how that's being spent and doing forensic with people like Drew and people like Julie a lot of people in this room it's unbelievable okay Edward where you at My name's Edward Yaslino, and I own a restaurant called Pizza Roma. I'm one block up from Christie, and we've had lots of incidents in the last six months. We've been broken into three times. Our fence has been, I had to put up a fence around the building mm -hmm. because it, they would steal, I put up some tents for the COVID time. Uh, they would steal the sides of my tents. I would pull up there, there would be people out in their cars parked all along in my driveway, around the building, and whenever I would confront them, I'd have my life threatened. They would, you know, and I'd call the police, but nobody came. We were broke into, like I said, three times. I have my phone, I keep next to my bed because that's when Alarm Central calls me at three o'clock in the morning. I have to respond. I live out of town. I live 40 minutes out of town. I grew up here in Portland, but I have to come in, and I'm there well before the police get there. In fact, the average time was five hours for them to respond. Oh my God. And they were, the, the police officers were you know, cordial, and they just explained to me, they go, look, the one police officer said, I'm at a murder up at, at uh, Mall 205. And I'm thinking, I'm on 47th and Woodstock, and you're my local guy? Yeah. And you took you five hours you know, before you can even come over here? That's miles away. So whoever came up with the idea of defunding the police well, uh, that doesn't work. Nope. We were just, in fact, the people in our neighborhood were getting together to try to get a private company, a uh, security company, and the price was $10,000 a month. You know, yeah, maybe we have to go private. Maybe that'll be best. Um, this makes me think of a novel I read a long time ago, and it was called Atlas Shrugs. And I saw that everybody put their arms up, you know, almost everybody put their arms, they want to leave Portland. I don't want to go find, what, what was it, uh, Galt's Gulch, where all the productive people would leave the area. I think we need to make Portland our Gulch and try to take this back. Yeah. 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 Hi, my name is Jason Bennington. I'm a local contractor and handyman and a family man. I've got um, seven kids and one on the way. We live in the heart of Portland. I've been here for over 15 years. Um, my wife has lived here her entire life. When I first moved here and I heard the term felony flats, I thought it was a joke because the places where I lived in Arizona were far worse than this so-called felony flats. Um, and people would talk about the prostitutes that walked down 82nd, and I'd go, well, what prostitutes? Because there wasn't any. They cleaned up the city. And uh, now we're way, we're not just back to what it apparently was in the past, but we're far, far, far beyond that. Um, one of the businesses that I was working at on Burnside around 115th was broken into six times in a period of two weeks. I had thousands of dollars worth of tools stolen, which of course as a handyman, tools are my livelihood. It's how I feed my family. Um, the place, of course, had drug paraphernalia left everywhere. This guy seemed to have made it his personal goal to camp out in that house every night that I wasn't there. When the police were called, um, I didn't tell them that I was a contractor working in the property. I told them somebody is in my home right now. 
I believe they're in there. It took them over 35 minutes to arrive at the scene without me knowing if there was an armed assailant in my home. Can you imagine somebody broke into your home and took the police 35 minutes to get there? Which, don't even get me started on the Measure 114 because they're apparently trying to take our right to defend ourselves against these break-ins. Uh -huh. I mean, oh, yeah. as you all know, you probably have heard the saying already, when seconds, when minutes count, the police take, or when seconds count, the police are only minutes away, which is yeah. often the way that it is here in Portland, if not hours oh. away. Um, I'm working pro currently at a property over on uh, Bush Street uh, near 82nd, Directly across from this property, there is a van that is selling drugs out of it. There's a line, usually, and multiple cars pull up and stop all day long. I called the police, told them about the situation, and they told me they can't do anything because of Measure 110. Well, I call BS on that because Measure 110 does not um, leave drug dealing open no, to, no, it to, it does no, not at all. Not and in Clackamas County and every other county in the city, that would be enforced almost immediately. It's only in Multnomah County. So let's get to what the root of the problem is here. It's Mike Schmidt. Oh, yeah. Yes. 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 So, um, I did a little Googling, and I'd like to get together with some other business owners and maybe raise some funds to get this action going, because um, a proceeding to suspend or remove a district attorney is commenced by filing with the clerk of Superior Court of the county where the district attorney resides, a sworn affidavit charging the district attorney with one or more grounds for removal. So. Uh, the following grounds for suspension are um, uh, number two, willful misconduct in office, clearly guilty of that. Number yeah. three, willful and persistent failure to perform his duties, yes. clearly yeah. in violation of that one. Um, conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice, which brings yeah. the office into disrepute, clearly in violation of that one. So uh, let's get together, local business owners, and let's get this filing started almost immediately. Um, I also want to address what Mike, the previous speaker, had said um, about there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs, um, which is actually a famous quote from Thomas Sowell. Um, and uh, that's true, it's quite true. Uh, we're not going to find solutions that are going are, are to meet for everybody. But the people that these solutions aren't going to work for are the poverty pimps in our local yeah. government that are making money oh, off yeah. of that are making money off of this homelessness, okay? And additionally, the people who will suffer are the drug addicts and criminals who do not want to clean up their lives, who do not want to make any changes. Those are the only people who are gonna suffer here. In closing, there's just one, uh, one thing I wanna leave you guys with. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. Now, we're in hard times. And it's time for strong men and women to stand up and do something. Yeah. Nice job, nice job. Good job. We've got a few more. Um, Jocelyn, Jocelyn, I don't know where you are, but Jocelyn, and then um, I'm gonna put, um, is Angelique, Angelique's here, right? I'm gonna put you on deck, meaning you're after her. While she's walking up here, I want to note that we had a business owner here that was going to speak, and she asked me in a flurry out the door, Angela, I'm so sorry, there's an emergency at my business. I cannot speak. I have to go. Yes, it's over what we're discussing. Isn't that insane? Okay, go ahead. Hi. <coughs> my name's Johnson. I run a photo booth company here in Portland uh, called Photos with Chick. Um, uh, I've been running for about nine years. Um, I have about 30 booths, and I've lived here for 25 years, 18 of those in a house that I own in Southeast. Um, a little uh, less than two years ago, my house was robbed while I was two blocks away. My car was in the driveway. I could have easily been home. Um, I haven't felt secure since then. Um, then about a year ago, my phone booth started getting robbed. Uh, eight of them, all in different locations all over town. Uh, I have security footage of the perpetrators. Um, I have high resolution pictures of them because they took pictures in the photo booths as they were robbing them. Um, and I got some pictures before they were permanently deleted. So, and because you're spreading this information, I got lots of information about where they live, probably what their names are, how to find them, and given all of this information to the police. And um, as far as I know, none of this has been used to track them down. Um, so, 
Uh, but they cost my business thousands of dollars in damage, more damage than the money they stole. And it's not just me. They're out there every day. I get calls every day from people at different bars and locations calling me to let me know that they're here, or they've just robbed this place, or they've just robbed someplace else. And I keep calling the police, and they haven't done anything. So I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> they rob change machines, photo booths, vending machines, pinball, anything they can get their hands on that's got cash in it. Um, I mean, I pay a ridiculous amount of money in taxes every year because of my home and my business property tax yep. and my income tax. Yep. And, and I pay tens of thousands of dollars to these local businesses in commissions that I work with. And I'm proud of that because those are the people that are fellow entrepreneurs and people that make Portland amazing. And I'm proud to give them money. But where are my tax dollars? Yeah. Where are my kids? Yeah, I don't feel safe going downtown anymore. That's where several of my photo booths are. Um, last Tuesday at 5 p.m., uh, I was walking downtown to get to one of my booths. In one block radius, a woman came stumbling at me, vomited so close I could feel it. Um, and then right behind her was a guy with his pants around his knees, um, shooting up in his genitals. Next to that guy was a guy smoking something out of tinfoil. And, <laughs> and it, was, it was like the apocalypse. It scared the crap out of me. I'm not going downtown by myself anymore. I can't do it. Um, anyway, I will skip over the rest of that stuff and wrap it up. I worked downtown for 16 years, and I used to know all of the homes people. It was uh, Lefty and Norman Stanley and like Elvis, you know? And, and they're wonderful people, and they would do anything to protect you. And there they're were characters, and it's zombies now. They're not there anymore. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, I have Portland tattooed on my forearm. And for the first time in 25 years, I'm considering leaving because I don't love it the way it is anymore. I just, I, I want to know what to do to fix this. I, I want to get involved and I want to get other people involved. And thank you for doing this. Hi, all. I'm not from the Portland area, but I'm in Portland a lot. I have a brother that's uh, house challenged, um, mental issues. He does a really pretty good job living on his own, but he will not travel the streets of Portland during the day. He's been assaulted on Max. He's uh, just three weeks ago, black guy, because somebody assaulted him on the street. He travels with his cat. He's scared. He's afraid to take the cat with him now. Um, I have faced the scourge of Portland, and I'm going to call him scourge because most of them are. Uh, they burnt my car outside of the Portland School District a year ago, $5,000 worth of damage because they didn't like my flag. I'm proud of the American flag, and I think everybody here is, and everybody should be. If you don't like this country, they say pack your bags and leave. Um, oh, here, here. If you want better, and if you think you can make it better somewhere else, by all means, do that. But not at the expense of other people. Um, not only have I had my car burnt, I have been threatened with fire, burning a flag. Um, I've been, a, I've been threatened with firearms, bullet for bullet, gun for gun. I said, you're right, that's how that works. Um, he got the message and he walked away from me. Um, I don't back down from them and I, it saddens me to see Portland this way. I used to bring my kids to Portland for uh, the Rose Festival. There's no way, if they were to bring that back, there's no way I'd bring my family down here. It's nasty. The, I've watched people step over people laying in the street, laying on the sidewalk. You talk about your homeless being treated, overdosing on fentanyl, and the medics just leave them in the street. Yeah, you know why they leave them in the street? It's because they have rights. Their rights are to say, I don't need help, it's okay. But I get to overdose 15 times in a month, and you keep getting to inject me with Narcan, over and over and over. That's not compassion. That's not compassion. That's inhumane to keep treating people that way and to allow them to live that way. It's also inhumane to try and force them to live the way that we want them to live because they can't. They don't know how. My brother cannot live the same way I do. He cannot live the same way you do. It's a different lifestyle. It's due to fetal alcohol syndrome. It's due to trauma to the brain from being hit by a car. It's due to molestation from other people on the street, drugs. You want to help them, you sit down and talk to them and find out what their needs are. That's how you make some things better. But this city, 
it, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. It, it's bad. I mean, just lay it out there. It's, it's nasty all the way around. So whatever I can do as a small business owner, the other thing with the homeless and your mental ill and the drug users, they go to the hospitals here. They ship them out to the other cities. They ship them out to my town because we have a warming center. They don't care that they don't have a place to go. So we need housing. Not just housing, but treatment. Real treatment. So treatment. that's my thing. Yeah, you'd like to go after Tim. I'm so sorry. I just kind of, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tim. Angela, thank you for this. This is an amazing turnout. Um, so my name is Tim LeMaster. I ran for actually state representative on the inner northeast here. Uh, very much an uphill battle. And the reason was exactly the reason you all are here, is there was no options on the ballot. There, and that's one of the things I just plainly want to bring out with everybody here. You got to engage, and it's all levels from the state on down. It is a direct link. The, the Measure 110, I hear people going on it. That, unfortunately, we voted for it, you know, but there's nothing out there. Our, and I can tell you firsthand, I sat across from my representative in a discussion with the Willamette Week, and business owners, you have no advocacy at the state level. I'm telling you that flat out. You can see the policies that are coming down. They are disconnected. I'm glad and incredibly happy to see the small business owners here. That's something that really disappointed me for, for my little campaign, you know, was trying to reach out and figure it out. But I'm glad to see that you're coming together. You are a powerhouse machine, and, and I, I really greatly hope that you all come together more and, and, and exert the will and, and the knowledge. You're connected with the community, you know what's going on, you have your own first-hand experiences, you're in the positions to bring that uh, the, of, of your clients and the people that you work with and to be a voice to that. And I guess, you know, all the things here that we talk about, the homelessness, etc., that's going on, that would be something that I would absolutely recommend. Every single candidate, no matter what party they're sitting in, at all levels of your local government, you need to look at and find out who can primary them. They, sh they need to be held to account. They need to have their feet held to the fire. The way that happens is by, you know, whether it's even you yourself throwing your hands up and saying, you know what, I'm gonna take that minute, sit across from them and call them out for the lack of, you know, smart policies that they're putting in place. Um, you know, it's, it's a scary thing. I ran as a Republican in the Northeast, and that's terrifying knocking on doors. You know, but it was amazing. In all reality, everybody was good. So even if you can go in and have those tough conversations, people see it, the people are living it, you all are part of it, and if you can bring that story or find the people that are willing to step up, uh, you know, that's how the accountability comes in, and that's one of the fundamental ways of change. There's no point in recalling D.A. Schmidt if you don't have somebody in queue that's going to be better than him. Like, what's the point of that? Well, that's great to hear and wonderful to hear. But that's all part of it, but it takes us, it takes you to help flesh that out and to make that aspect of the change happen. And um, honestly, I look forward to seeing any of you as a rival in my district and in a heartbeat. Thank you. It's so good to see everyone here today. and. Uh, to know that there's other people that feel the same way you do. My name is Juanita Swartwood. I live in the Lentz neighborhood, and I'm involved with the Lentz Neighborhood Livability Association, the LNLA. They have boots on the ground picking up the trash that accumulates from the homeless camps. I have personally, my husband and I, have been out there picking up needles. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to talk to you today that I haven't heard a lot about is the fact that I have children and grandchildren that live in this neighborhood that have to walk daily to school. And my heart was broken um, when I watched teenage girls get off the bus to be approached by sex trafficking and, it, and the children that have to walk through it, the gauntlet, I call it, of uh, crime that our children have to go through to get on and off the bus and to get home. And um, it's heartbreaking. And I have a one-year-old granddaughter, and I know that she's going to be homeschooled because we cannot allow our children to walk on the streets for what you guys are afraid to walk through. We send our children through every single day. 
So I'd like to encourage you to not only think about now, but what are we going to leave for our children in the future? Um, I personally retired from the Portland Development Commission. I've worked on uh, the projects, the tram, the pearl, the waterfront, the beautiful parks. What are we going to have left and where is the money that's going to be available to rehabilitate these areas now? Um, it's heartbreaking to hear business owners say they close their doors because they're afraid. Well, if you think you're afraid, how do you think the elderly feel and the children that have to walk in and out and to get to and from places? So I would like to encourage you to not just let it die here today, but to keep continued, and, and it's scary because you put yourself out there, but I would like to encourage you to continue to do what Angela is doing here today, and that's to bring light to the fact that they are not listening to a lot of the voices in this community. And um, I will close with one example in our neighborhood. I was walking through a huge homeless camp cleaning up on NAP. And I look into this car and there's a probably two-year-old and no more than a four-year-old and a man in the car with a cat. And I looked at the people that were with me and I said, is that, did I see that right? And they said, yeah. So I went back and I called and I reported it immediately. And you know, I feel for people that are homeless, but if you see something that's out of the norm, please, step up to the plate yes. because I am advocating for our children and our future. We're talking about Portland and our children are the ones that are going to inherit these problems. So please, Portland, don't turn a blind eye to this and be vigilant in speaking with your community uh, advocates. So I'd like to leave that. And also, I got to thinking about the first time that I came to Portland. I was on the plane, it was 50 years ago, this next month, I was on the plane with the Janssen, the president of Janssen, and I flew out with Ike and Tina Turner and their band, and it was a totally different place than it is today. Yeah, for sure is. It is not the same place. So we need to be vigilant in what we're doing. Thank you. conclude today and thank everybody who spoke and thank you for all of you for coming. I know some of you, it was an act of bravery and I really want to acknowledge you for that. I really do. And just a, just a last thing to say to you. Um, there will come a day where I won't check every single message that comes into Instagram, but I do now. And so if you need something to get out if you need your story to be told if you want people to know about something that's happened to you or you have content or you've researched something and you want to tell the public that's why i'm here thank you <laughs>